Hey everybody, warm welcome to the session with Sequoia Capital. My name is Mika Huttunen, I'm the CEO at Slush. Um, Sequoia Capital is no doubt one of the most prestigious venture funds in the whole world and admired by many. Since 1972, they have invested over in the, over a thousand companies, including companies like Apple, Google, Oracle, Nvidia, GitHub, PayPal, Stripe, and the list goes on. Through the 1980s, uh, Sequoia had a rule established by the by the first partners: if we if we if we can't ride a bicycle to the company's office, we won't invest. <laughs> well, um, now in 2020, Sequoia is opening their European office, and the question is why. Why now? And what should European founders know about this? I'm joined by three brilliant minds for this session. Luciana, Matthew and Steve. Luciana Lisandro is the European partner at, Se at Sequoia. Me last year's Midas list number 20. And also former partner at Axel. Also we're joined by Matt Miller partner at Sequoia for the soon nine years and he has worked with companies like Confluent, Okta, Graphcore and, and many many others. And Lucien and Matt are joined by a brilliant journalist Steve O'Hear who is a tech journalist focusing on especially European startups, products and companies. And that's the lineup for today. And before we head to the session, just a couple of rules and couple couple thoughts for the session, how we're going to run it. So practicalities. So the discussion will be around 20 minutes, followed by Q&A. And if you want to ask questions, simply use the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, we usually have time to, depending on the length of the questions, uh, to three to 10 questions. Let's see how, how it goes this time. And after the session, we're going to follow up with the, with the insights um, through your email. And finally, we're happy to retweet your tweet. So remember, just tag slash HQ. And that's pretty much it. Uh, let's jump right away to the session. And Steve, I'll let you take the stage. Thanks. OK, so we don't have like a tremendous amount of time. So I want to get like straight into it. Um, now, for those who have been covering the industry in Europe for as long as I have, um, we'll know that in the past, Sequoia has been at some points maybe slightly disparaging about Europe. I mean, a long time ago, um, particularly um, Michael Moritz. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to kick things off by reading back one quote from the past, which is that he said, I think he was talking about the European Union and Europe and um, its attitudes towards American tech giants. And I quote, he said, rather than pointing across the Atlantic and seeping scapegoats, the commissioners, that's the European Union, may want to start a series of investigations into Europe's own shortcomings. So my question is, and maybe Matt can start with you, um, what, and then we get to Luciana, what, what were or are Europe's shortcomings? And in that context, why is Sequoia launching in Europe and, and doubling down? So in other words, what has changed? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it shortcoming, Steve. I would say that there has been this evolution and maturity of the tech ecosystem that has been really meaningful, that has attracted us to want to put down boots on the ground and be more invested in Europe than ever before. And I think a few things have changed in the market. I think one is this change in the attitudes of young people. So Europe has always been this place where there's been incredible talent coming out of the computer science programs and, uh, across the universities, across the continent, and even the UK. And, and the, the, these young people previously were going into careers in investment banking and consulting or bigger conglomerates. And now, the, now, those, now those young people are interested in s startups and technology careers, and that's fueling a lot of great ideas and a lot of great talent. There's been capital invested in the system and, and companies have been able to get going. And for the first time, we're starting to see $10 billion plus companies. And there was this long time, this question of when will there be a $10 billion plus startup? And now there's multiple of them across the continent. And now the question's really changed to when will there be the next $100 billion startup in Europe? And I think it's just an evolution over time. And I think that people in Europe are getting more and more excited about startups and technology as an opportunity. And we find ourselves getting pulled 
more and more. So when we are looking at, we want to invest in the best AI micro, best AI semiconductor company in the world, we looked at them in China, Israel, and Europe. And the one we wanted to invest in was Graphcore in Bristol. And when we looked at wanting to invest in the best process automation company in the world, we looked at Automation Anywhere in California, and we looked at UiPath in Romania, and we looked at companies all over the world. And the one we wanted to invest in was UiPath in Romania. And that is increasingly becoming the case. And so we feel like Europe is more relevant than ever and more important than ever. And we feel like there is an increasing share of global market leaders coming from the continent that we want to be partners with early on in their journey. So that's why we're coming. I think Matt, sorry. I think Matt is spot on. And what I would add is that to some extent, success breeds success too. I think role models are really powerful. Um, and the fact that there have been these category leading companies created in, out of Europe, but that are winning on a global scale, like Spotify and Adyen and UiPath that man, Matt mentioned and Unity and the list goes on. I think that's really inspirational to the next generation of founders. Um, and I think that has helped a lot. Uh -huh. Now you mentioned sort of companies that are valued at over $10 billion, right? So not, not you know, these are not unicorns. These are, I think some people call them decacorns. Right. And one of those companies, of course, is Klarna, which Sequoia has backed, and I believe backed in 2010. Right. I mean, that's like 10 years ago. So it still feels like a long time coming um, to get to Europe. I mean, it'll double down. But of course, you've been investing in Europe quite quietly over many, many years. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But first of all, can you clear something up? Um, the Sequoia fund so when you invest in Europe going forward that's not from a separate fund is it that's from the same fund in the US is that is that correct uh, yes I'm, I'm happy to talk about this absolutely we work as one partnership across mm -hmm. two geographies um, and we invest from the same pool of capital across both geographies and the rationale behind that is exactly what Max talked about we want to to be able to partner with category leading companies. And if they start in Paris or in Stockholm or in San Francisco, for us, it does not make a difference. We want to partner with them early and we want to be able to help them on the ground early. Again, whether they start here in Europe or in the US. Uh, and are you able to share how the carry, so in other words, the, the profits that the fund makes are gonna be split across the, like the US and Europe? And I'll tell you why I asked that question, because like a lot of VCs have told me over the years, that the value that Sequoia investment in Europe brings most of all is connections to the US. So I'm wondering how you're going to incentivize the US team that's on a different timeline, you know, even on the ground to help those European startups. And that, that's what I'm asking about, Carry. So one of the things, Steve, that I, I love the most about Sequoia, having been here close to nine years now, is the way that we operate is very, very team centric in that everybody is compensated the same amount in a fund, whether or not it is the investment that they led or the investment that their partner led. And we drive towards having great funds for our LPs. And so when we make an investment, we lock arms together as a team and we work collectively to help that company be successful. And one of the greatest things that Sequoia is when we have a, have a wonderful event like uh, uh, the IPO of Unity, which occurred lately, which is another company we've been investors in all, for a long time that was started in Europe. When that, when that event happens, we send it around an email internally where we talk about how everybody touched, who all touched the company and what the impact they had from Sequoia. And that's something that we really aspire to as a team. And so we look at these European opportunities as we want to help them in every way we can from the US from connections. We're also planning to apply the team in the US for various aspects of company building. Like we have Carl Eschenbach as part of our team, who's arguably the best software go-to-market leader on the planet, scaled VMware from 60 million to 7 billion of revenue. We have Bill Corrin on our team, who was the SVP of engineering at Google and one of the best engineering leaders on the planet. We have Bogomil Balkansky, who's one of the best product marketers on the planet. And so we bring these talented people to bear across all of our investments, whether they be in, in Stockholm or San Francisco. 
and and the and the economic model is the one that supports that. Uh -huh. And another question I get asked a lot is, you know, when I talk to seed investors in Europe, and I say, "Hey, what do you think about Sequoia coming to Europe properly?" You know, like doubling down on Europe. And the seed investors always say, yeah, it's like, it's great. You know, they don't compete with us. They invest further up, further up the, you know, the funnel, right? Um, but of course, Sequoia does do seed, right? And the same, by the way, the Series A investors say the same. They're like, oh no, Sequoia does B round. So can you try and clear up once and for all, like what is Sequoia's seed strategy, particularly in Europe? And what stages is the European team going to be investing in going forward? Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this. And I think this was one of the things that really got me so excited about how Sequoia operates. We invest throughout the journey of, of a founder and throughout the journey of a company. We invest everywhere from seed to, to growth to when companies are later and beyond. In fact, our tagline is from idea to IPO and beyond. So we do invest across stages. Um, now that said, we want to be very collaborative, especially at the seed stage. We, you know, in Europe, the seed ecosystem is very local. There are great seed funds based in France, based in Germany, based in Eastern Europe, and, and the list goes on. Um, and we want to collaborate with these seed funds. We do want to partner early with founders because we think that the, the type of outlier founders who really want to change the status quo, the type of founders we want to partner with, no, we, we want to find them as early as possible and we will be collaborative at seed. Uh -huh. And do you, how does Sequoia look at, you know, the signaling, the signaling issue, by which I mean is if you do a seed round and then you don't do the series A round, obviously the market is like, hey, what's going on here? So I'm just wondering if you're going to be covering those from, from super, super early. Like, yeah, how do you see signaling? Yeah, so that's a question that we get, we, we receive often. The reality is, is we're in a hyper competitive venture market where there are a lot of wonderful funds that are, that can do great things or companies that are trying to find opportunities to invest. And there are times where it makes sense for us to double down and invest more. There are times where the founder might want to have another party uh, around the table for reasons, you know, like they might have something or some partner that they gravitate to. And so it, signaling is less of, feels to be less of an issue because every round these days is a competitive dogfight. And so sometimes we have the opportunity to lead the next round and we've earned that and it works out. Sometimes we do not. And we hope to do, we hope to lead as many of the future rounds as we can, but uh, you know, companies go different paths and, and choose different alternatives. At the end of the day, it's up to the entrepreneur. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I guess it is, unless you guys don't want to do the Series A after doing the seed, then, I mean, that's that's the signal, right? Yeah, I, I would push back on that because I'd argue that there are many seed investments that we have done that have been led by some of our most esteemed competitors in Series A. And so, you know, it, it's a matter of everybody has a different perspective. Everybody is doing different work. It's a very hyper competitive environment. And there are many of the seed investments that have been led by Index or uh, Andreessen or or other or other companies where we have we have done we have done the seed where they led the later rounds. Uh -huh. Okay, great. I think yeah, that answers that one. So I'm thinking another one I want to clear up. Again, I'm sort of I'm I'm relaying all the mythology around Sequoia in Europe here. So I'm I'm doing a great public service. Um, the other one is. You're welcome. So like, um, I want to talk about deal flow at the very early stage um, in terms of if Sequoia is doing seed, and as I say, it's known they are, they do, but it's, they're not always announced a lot of these deals, right? Um, is it true that Sequoia has, so I know you have an angel network in the US, but I'm hearing that there's an angel network or there's some angels that you formerly have as like a scouting network in Europe. Is that true? Is there a scouting network in Europe? That's absolutely correct. You know, one of the things that we engineered about a decade ago was we wanted to equip the people who were close to our ecosystem to be able to go and identify great investment opportunities for ourselves. And so we have a scouts program that's been written about and talked about here in the United States. And one of the things that we have done as we've entered Europe more formally with partners on the ground is we've extended our scouts program to include European contacts 
and the ability to invest in companies that are based in Europe. And what I would add to this is that it's also really about building a community. We want to, to bring people into the Sequoia community as we're getting started in Europe. So these are people that we have known for a long period of time, we've been working with for a long period of time. And yes, it is of course about finding the next really great entrepreneur and, and the next really great company, but it's also for us about building a tight knit community in Europe. Uh -huh. And in terms of the Scout Network here in Europe, how many people are we talking about at the moment? We'd, well, uh, we'd like to go ahead, go ahead Matt. No, I was just going to say we don't we don't actively disclose the, the numbers because the numbers vary from time to time. Uh, some people come on, some people come off, um, but it's something that we're in the early stages of building and very excited about the people that we have as part of this community. Okay, awesome. Um, so I want to talk about competition in terms of competition for like getting in on deals and how Sequoia coming to Europe may change the competitive dynamics. Um, obviously, it's known that, you know, the Axel were not really happy when Luciana left, um, which obviously is a massive compliment. I really hope that TechCrunch are just as unhappy if and when I leave. Um, but more seriously, will Sequoia, you know, formally come into Europe? Would it sort of, do you think it will push up valuations? I mean, you mentioned it before it's hyper competitive already. But this actually feels like, even though it's amazing progress for Europe, for a firm like Sequoia to come here, it does feel like dynamics might shift. I think that, um, first of all, I respect and we respect all our competitors on the ground. Um, I had a, a great eight years at Excel. Um, Index has, has done a fabulous job here as well. And, and there are more and more funds from firms from the US looking at Europe. I think that the, at the end of the day, the, the type of founder who wants to work with Sequoia is the founder who wants to win on a global scale. If you think about how Sequoia is structured, we started in the Valley five decades ago. And if you think about firms that have really shaped venture capital over the past five decades, from, from my perspective, this you know, Sequoia is at, at the top of the list. We have been active in India and in China for over a decade. Now we're on the, we're on the ground in Europe. So I think there will be a, a selection, right? There will be a certain founder chemistry and a certain founder fit who, who will make a lot of sense for, for the, those founders to partner with Sequoia. And I would just add Steve on the Luciana point. I can't even express like how excited we are to have Luciana as our first partner on the ground in Europe. We've been studying and planning and preparing for this entry for well over a year. And from the very beginning, we knew that Luciana was the partner we wanted to have to build this. We identified her as the best rising star investor in Europe, and she was always at the top of our list. It was really hard to get her, but boy, are we so thankful to have her on our team. <laughs> Matt is too kind to me, and uh, you know, it was uh, we we mutually chose each other. I would say that I think we there was a clear alignment of values and of how we think about the world when it comes to venture capital from early on. Uh, okay, well, that's like a perfect segue into my next question, because I want to talk about the team that you're going to build here in Europe. Um, because everybody, again, it's a question everybody asks me, like, how big is this team going to be in terms of, say, like investment partners? I mean, one person even said to me yesterday, if Sequoia is so serious about Europe now, why are you only starting with um, I guess two, three investment partners. Um, so do you want to tell me like, how big is the team, the team going to be and what can we expect in terms of how that is divided between, say, investment, or you've already just announced a head of talent, right? Uh, any yeah. other sort of operational support that you're going to build out here in, like, on the ground rather than just re relying on the US? So I'm, I'm happy to take that one, Steve. So one of, the, one of the most important things and significance of us making the decision to hire a local team and open an office is at Sequoia. When we are in, we are all in. And we have opened geographies like China and India before, where we have become the most dominant venture capital franchise in those regions. And we are all in on Europe and our intent is to do the same. But we know from past experience that if we roll into a new geography and we hire a 20 person brand new team, that that's a recipe for disaster. And the way we have set up Europe is this is an extension of the team that has currently been working together 
based out of Menlo Park in California. And we're slowly adding and expanding that team so that we have the ability to recruit really, really great people and, and, and have our culture permeate and our, our, our learnings as an organization permeate so that this is a natural expansion of our efforts. And so we would rather take it gradually and hire outstanding people and, and slowly build up a team than roll up with 20 new people. But we are as committed as ever to building the dominant venture franchise in Europe. Just as I we have China you know. in the United States. So you're going to Sorry. Your With Zoom, it's always a little bit of, of friction, apologies. Um, you know, if I may add a personal note, of course, as uh, as I was thinking through through this opportunity, this was a big question for me, and and I became very quickly very convinced about Sequoia's commitment to Europe and the fact that actually it took Sequoia a little bit of time to make this decision. I think, and the fact that you know, since in the in the past decade Sequoia has not entered a new continent, I think it actually shows how thoughtful we are as a team about entering a new geography and how committed we are and when we do enter a new geography. Um, if we think about the team, you know, we, there, is, there was a, a conversation of mutual trust that we would figure out exactly what makes sense, which I think is, is the right way to think about it. And if you think about what success looks like, looks like for us, if we think five or seven years out, and if we think about the founders who are really changing the status quo that come out of Europe, we want to partner with all those founders. We want to partner with those founders early and we're working backwards and we're thinking through what type of team it makes sense to build. Uh -huh. And Matt, you said that if you built out a team of 20 from the get-go, you said that would be a disaster. Um, and then you mentioned you talked about Sequoia's culture. So just perhaps really briefly, I'm curious, why would that be a disaster? And what, how, how would you describe Sequoia's culture in, a, in terms, and try to do it in, in ways that is actually tangible and not generic, you know what I mean? Everyone talks about culture. Oh, no, totally. I'd say that, 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 that this is a long-term business where you build long-term relationships of trust with your partners. And for you to have good partnership dynamics, you have to build and establish that that trust because we're we're thousands of miles apart, but yet we're unified in mission and purpose. <clears throat> and to have 20 new people with a 20 person investment team here, here that's based in Menlo Park, that would just be a so many new voices, it would just be hard to integrate and, and adopt. And and as as we tell many of our portfolio companies, start small <clears throat> in the beginning. <clears throat> and be incremental in your hiring. And <clears throat> that's absolutely what we intend to do in Europe is we wanna start with a small elite team and then we wanna to add to it and add to it as we grow and expand so that we can make sure that our culture ties over. And then what is it I would describe about the Sequoia culture? Like one is key element is trust. A second key element is, is that we, we like to work very closely as a team and we like to have really strong interpersonal relationships which is another reason why we move gradually rather than being too aggressive. Uh, we like to, we like to, I mean, we have a huge culture of winning and a huge culture of company building. We, we, we view our, our investments as not as just investments, but as partnerships. And we talk about how we work with these companies as a team. And again, these are things that we like to teach and bring new hires into. And by moving, moving slowly, but thoughtfully with a long-term vision in mind, we feel like that is the best way for us to, to get our start. And if I could add to this, um, when I was getting to know Sequoia better, people always talked about teamwork <clears throat> and how teamwork was at the center of everything. And really it took me starting and actually seeing this in action to understand how much focus there is on teamwork. I mean, firstly, just when George and I started here, the, the welcome has been overwhelming. Of course, I expected a very warm welcome, but I cannot emphasize enough the number of FaceTime calls, Zooms, WhatsApps, messages we get constantly. People get up at all sorts of times of the day in order to chat with us, in order to help us think about opportunities. Uh, people work weekends. Whenever, whenever I call Matt or whenever I call any of the other partners, they, they pick up if it's 5 a.m. or if it's a Saturday or if it's a Sunday. 
the level of helping each other and teamwork and commitment has has really been incredible and is incredible. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so I think I'm going to start pulling in some audience questions. Um, so then we might jump around quite a lot, uh, even more than I did. Um, so I guess to start with, because we haven't really talked about what, what Sequoia looks for in companies, or we haven't talked about like, the current kind of you know, tech trend. So I guess the first question somebody, um, somebody put is which, like what are the three things that you look for in a European startup um, to make it a good fit for Sequoia? Um, I really wish, Steve, that I had a, a checklist of three things. <laughs> My life would be so much easier. I could wake up later and go to bed earlier. Um, it's, it's not quite like that because we look for outliers. Um, and that means that you know, outliers come from, from all sorts of backgrounds and, and think about the world in, in different ways. If I had to simplify it, I would say is the following. Uh, we look for founders who on the consumer side, want to change that the way that consumers live their lives. And on the enterprise side, want to change the way that enterprises run the business. We look for, for founders who want to build enduring and generational companies. And I wish there was a, a checklist and a check the box, but these founders and these companies come in in different shapes and forms. The, the one liner I like to use is we look for people who are hell bent on making a dent in the universe. And that grit and passion and ambition targeted at a great at a large market opportunity is so exciting to all of us. And um, how how much this is this comes from someone cl claiming to be Sam Seed, which is another journalist, so I really shouldn't give him any airtime. But um, <laughs> he, he asks, um, how much capital do you expect to invest in Europe in the next three years? In other words, you've already said that it's the one fund. You know, there isn't a separate Sequoia Europe, but can we can we get an idea of how much capital you plan to deploy in, in the next three years? So the answer there is, is we don't know. Uh, we don't make uh, allocations as to how we will deploy our funds. And we don't have set time horizons under which we deploy our funds. We have some funds that we've invested more quickly. We have some funds that we've invested over a long period of time. We look for the best opportunities across this landscape of what we call the West of Europe and the United States and, and a little bit of Canada. And, and we, will make, we will make investments in the best opportunities we see as we see them. And there are periods when there are lulls in our business and there are periods when it's very, very active or where it may be more active one, one place than the other. It's hard to explain those, but we're, we are excited to invest in, in great companies over the last three years. We've invested $400 million in opportunities in Europe. So, you know, if, if that might be the future, who knows? But, but really, we just want to invest in the best companies. And we're in a fortunate position to always have the funds to be able to do so. Uh -huh. So somebody else asked, um, obviously, I gave you a, kind of a hard time about doing seed and signaling. And, um, you know, I noted that a lot of the seed deals don't seem to be announced. So it's a, someone's asking me if, if you're ever going to do like even earlier than seed, and even if we try to, it's hard sometimes to define seed, pre-seed or whatever, but they also want to know, um, do you ever invest in kind of idea stage? In other words, as, as you go earlier, what proof points are you looking for and how early may, may, may you eventually go? Should I take this one, Matt? Yeah, go for it. I mentioned before, our tagline is from idea to IPO and beyond. We love intersecting founders as early as possible. We love being there as they're shaping their thinking, as they're figuring out their product market fit. And at the end of the day, at any stage, and in particular at that stage, it's, it's about people. Uh -huh. And uh, switching subjects again, COVID or the coronavirus pandemic, obviously we, we've, we've always talked about this a lot, anyone who's done any events in the last six months, but how does the coronavirus or pandemics and the so-called new normal, how has that changed the way Sequoia is thinking about investments in general? And also it's kind of, it's funny timing, isn't it, right? That like you're coming to Europe and this 
completely sort of um, disrupted, you know, time of our lives. And I gather that, Matt, you're moving to London. Is that right? And you yes. haven't been able to? That's yeah. correct. You've had to delay that because of the coronavirus. Yeah. So the question is, how has the coronavirus or the pandemic changed the way you're thinking about investments going forward? So, so, so the, the, the way we look at it is the pandemic is hopefully a two to three year disruption. And we are making an investment in Europe that we hope to yield dividends over decades. And, and so there is never a perfect time. We obviously started this process pre-pandemic. Uh, and I had a plan to be there on the ground now, but I will be, and, but I have young children and, and with all of that dynamic, we felt it was better to wait until there was at least a vaccine or some breathing room. So I'm hoping to be there this summer. Um, but there's been a lot of interesting things that the pandemic has done that have been a huge positive. Like I'd say for collaborating and working more closely across the, the team in Menlo Park and the team in, in uh, London, it's been great to have Zoom as this ability where everybody is on Zoom versus a conference room full of people and two or three people dialing into the conference room. Uh, it's been a really nice experience, I think, to onboard and give us a really great foundation to start as a team. And it's also been great because we've been able to get the full team engaged quickly in the opportunities that Luciana is surfacing from being there on the ground. And so she surfaces a super exciting opportunity and boom, we can get the whole team on a Zoom really quickly. And that is much more acceptable today than it was a couple of years ago where you needed to go fly and be in person. And, and so I think there's been a lot of benefit to the business from the, the dynamic of us all needing to be remote and, and work from work from Zooms, uh, um, as well as there's been headwinds, obviously. And as far as like our investing appetite, you know, it's the same thing, as I said earlier, you know, we feel, feel these are opportunities measured in decades, not in years. And so we are just as active investing now as we were pre-pandemic. And what I would add is we're, we're trying to still make it as personal as possible over Zoom. So we'll do these things called suppers with founders and we'll send a little package and we'll, we'll have the same meal over Zoom. Um, and we, yeah, we, we try to be creative to, to still make the connection as personal as possible, although it's through a screen like now. <laughs> Sounds great. I had a, an event. They sent me lunch. I didn't in the end make it to the event and the food sucked. So, yeah. Oh, I, I was hoping you would say it, but the lunch was great. <laughs> Not no, even. no. I thought I was so clever. But no, that sounds great. Um, I mentioned earlier about the competitive landscape with, with you know, with a very big brand, American fund coming, coming to Europe or doubling down in Europe. As I say, we keep saying coming to Europe. But you guys have been here for, for years and years, actually. Um, but somebody asked, um, it's known that there's a couple of other big American firms are setting up or putting feet on the ground here. Um, so just more broadly, what do you think will, what do you think the biggest effect or how it will change things with, if there's a, a much bigger influx of US capital into Europe? I mean, we're seeing it already, but sort of not just the money, but also, as I say, personnel. I think it's great. I think it's a really good for, thing for the ecosystem. I think it's great for founders and I think it's it's great for us. We respect our competitors. We like having great competition. Um, I think it's a really good thing. And on, on, also, I think it's inevitable. The ecosystem is evolving. There are more and more really interesting companies and great founders coming out of Europe. So, of course, it's, it's a balance between opportunity and, and capital. So I, I think it's a really good thing. Uh, and somebody else asked about different sort of regions or tech hubs in Europe. And I think it's a really good question. So which, which sort of tech hubs are you most excited about? And, and I suppose not just like the, the usual suspects, but even some ones that are more of the beaten track. I know which one Matt is excited about. Do you want to talk <laughs> about that and then I'll share? <laughs> I mean, my favorite, my favorite is personally Stockholm. <clears throat> I lived in Sweden for a couple of years when I was younger, and I love every chance I get to go back to, to the Nordics. Uh, but the, the, look, the, the, the tech hub dynamic is one of the most exciting things about investing in Europe because an amazing company can literally come from anywhere. And that's very different than how the market has evolved in the United States and that, yeah, there are some tech hubs and, and you can get a company from anywhere, but there is a ton of aggregation in 
Silicon Valley and New York, and then maybe a little bit in pockets like Seattle and Utah. But, but, but there is tremendous diversity in the European landscape. And so each ecosystem has its pros and cons, and, but mostly pros, and we enjoy spending time across all of them. I don't know, Luciana, if you wanted to add more. Yeah, I think that the usual suspects are the UK, France, Germany, Nordics, and I sort of put all of Nordics in one <laughs> because obviously there, there are many hubs there as well. Um, I've, I'm from Eastern Europe, so I'm very biased, um, but I've, um, I've always been a big believer in the talents there. Um, I, I've been fortunate with, the, with my Eastern European investment so far. Um, and I do expect there is going to be more more good stuff coming from there as well. Uh -huh. So somebody asked about um, sort of diversity and inclusion, and um, specifically how Sequoia thinks about sort of encouraging and supporting their startups or their investments to think about D like DNI issues. I, I think the industry is not where it should be at. Um, I also think that for the past few years, we've been having the conversation and that's great. And uh, at Sequoia, this is really, really important to us. Um, so we'll, this is something we'll focus on. I like that I see that founders are focused on it already in, in Europe in general, the way that founders think about building their boards and think about building their businesses. Uh, so while we're not there, I think it's really good that we're, ha that we're having these conversations and this is, uh, you know, the starting point for change. Uh -huh. Just to push back on that a little bit, like, for years we've heard sort of coming out of Silicon Valley, this sort of idea of pattern matching, right? You know, like, two guys in a garage went to Stanford, blah, 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 right? And even in the UK, certainly a lot of founders seem to look and come from similar educational backgrounds, or they, you know, they typically went to Oxbridge, they did a stint at McKinsey. And, and I'm thinking that sometimes doesn't really tally with this idea of looking for outliers, right? It's like a mismatch. Um, so I just wondered how you think about that, sort of this over-reliance on quote-unquote pattern matching, and how that kind of goes against diversity. I would respectfully push back on you, actually, because... <laughs> about UiPath, I think that's a great example. And it's a good example because I, I was on the board and an investor in Sequoia as, as well. It's partly how we got to know each other. Um, if you look at uh, Daniel's profile, who has done a phenomenal job, and I think is really an inspiration to the next crop of enterprise entrepreneurs in Europe. He, he studied mathematics at the University of Bucharest. He spent a few times, a few years at Microsoft to be fair. In, in Seattle, but then he had been back in Bucharest for, for 10 years by the time that um, that he raised any venture capital. So I would actually, I would push back on that, yeah. Uh -huh, okay. Um, maybe maybe that's the exception to the rule, but I'm obviously talking from quite a London-centric view, I suspect. Yeah, I would just add, Steve, you know, we, we want to find the great opportunities wherever they are. We can do, we, we, we know we can do better. We are constantly challenging ourselves to be better. We are working on this. It is a big problem and a big focus area for us. But but we are absolutely not you know locked into the you have to go to Stanford to be somebody we fund. Uh, and we want to find the great opportunities and the great founders where they may wherever they may be and from whatever background they may come. Uh, do you think um, you sort of alluded to this? Do you think the fact that everybody's moved towards um, kind of remote working and it's more, you know, more um, amenable to using Zoom and, you know, how does that change sourcing? I mean, people have said, I used to get loads of press releases, right? People saying, oh, we did this deal and it was completely done remotely. But when you look into the detail, often people would met up in person prior to so that, you know, the, it started before the lockdown, if that makes sense. So I guess my question is a very long-winded one is how does this remote way of working affect both your deal flow, getting a deal across the line, but also surely it opens it up to being even more distributed and therefore you can find these pockets of talent from, like you said, Matt, earlier, from anywhere, right? I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a positive for founders and it's a positive for us. It's a positive for founders because founders can take more investment meetings from the comfort of their office quickly and efficiently 
via Zoom in the early days and, and in talking and getting to know people. And, and it's, they don't need to go and go visit, go fly to London to go visit a bunch of firms. We could, we could just have these conversations quickly over Zoom. And, and I think it's great because it's also enabling us to have a much broader reach to make sure that we can communicate with the founders in the smaller geographies where we may not have had a trip or an ability to go get there in a short period of time. And so I think that's a great equalizer and a great opportunity for founders and it's great for us. I do think that when you're entering into a business relationship that you are gonna be partners for a decade or more, that there's a lot of value to being in person. So even in the COVID world, we try our best to have some sort of interpersonal interaction if we can. We have definitely made investments where we have not met the founders in person at all during this period, but we also are doing socially distanced walks with masks and you know, trying to have those personal relationships because it just matters. And we think post the pandemic that that element will return. But the nice thing is, is that Zoom has now become a standard part of our practice and operating. And I think it will be a huge net positive for early meetings and early interactions and hopping on the phone quick and having a quick interpersonal dialogue where that may have been more challenging before. Uh -huh. And Luciano, I've wanted to ask this for ages. How was, how was UiPath, um, I don't want to use the word discovered, but like, because they were slightly off the beaten track, I understand. And I think one of their early investors is the, the VC company that invested in my completely failed attempt at a startup. Ah, is that true? Which one? Uh, I think so. I think I'm right. Uh, Credo Ventures. Absolutely, yes, yeah. they're great. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm so glad because I lost them so much money. So I'm so happy that they got in on UI Path. <laughs> <laughs> they're. I, I think they're doing great overall. Um, with UI Path, it was uh, an introduction from um, uh, from their other seed investor, from Early Bird, whom I'm very grateful uh, to from for this introduction. And um, I still remember my my first conversation with Daniel, and it was it was quite early at the time. Um, and from that day and from that conversation, it was very clear that he was thinking on a really, really big scale. And I like to bring up this example whenever people say, oh, are European founders ambitious enough? Yes, yes, look at some of these examples. For even early on, when it wasn't clear that robotic process automation would be a massive category, he always, you know, he, shooting from the star for, for the stars was his attitude. And he's done, he's done, he's done really, really well. Uh, no, absolutely. And just, I mean, the other thing we haven't really talked about is uh, how Sequoia views, you know, I, I did that early quote from Michael Moritz, fairly or unfairly, but obviously there is a different culture and a different um, kind of macro environment in terms of Europe's relationship with regulation um, and obviously, and even arguably the culture of perhaps the way we think about certain issues around I don't know whether it be the environment or kind of the way the way companies are organized in Europe is arguably different from Silicon Valley. So I'm just wondering what is the what are the strengths in Europe or the things that make the Europe ecosystem different from Silicon Valley in a good way? Or because we always talk about the negatives, you know, like people used to say, you know, European founders aren't ambitious enough, they, they don't think globally enough. Obviously, that's completely changed. But what are the sort of what is the cultural element of European startups is different from the Valley? I think that it. I, oh, sorry, Luciana, go ahead. Oh, this is the this is the challenge with with Zoom sometimes. There, there's this lag, but I'll I'll go and then you should go, Luciana. I think from my perspective, I think of it like one the the quantity and quality of computer science graduates. Three of the top five computer science programs in the world are in Europe, and and, the, and the, the quantity of great people coming out of Europe that are able to contribute to these companies is very high. And so I think that that is a huge differentiator. I think that number two, the European uh, technology scene is a, is a scene that is uh, filled with people that tend to be more loyal. And so they tend to stick with companies longer. And so there's less of this switching back and forth. Like here in Silicon Valley, it can be really competitive that you're there two years and then you're looking at your options and starting to look at what else may be out there um, because it can be very transactional in nature because there's so many companies in one place. 
And in Europe, where it's a little bit more fragmented, that leads towards people investing more time in one company, which I think helps make it easier for those companies to scale. And I think that the European perspective is opening up new categories that were never previously envisioned in the United States, like process and automation and process mining. Those are like European innovative categories that are tens of billions of dollars of available market uh, globally that were, that were driven by insights that came out of European uh, universities, at least in the process mining uh, uh, case. And so I, th I think that that's, that's very differentiated and like that you can argue the flip side of the coin on the regulation and that the regulation dynamic in Europe has allowed for this incredible fintech ecosystem where I think there's been a lot more innovation in European fintech than there's been in the United States because of the, the laws have allowed that. And so I think it can be cut both ways, but Europe for sure has this huge balance sheet of strengths of opportunity over the companies uh, that are based here in the Valley. And what I would add is the fact that Europe is not one unit, you have many different countries, it's, it's more difficult, but also because it's not trivial, right? Especially for consumer businesses, you start in the UK, you go to France, you go to Germany. It's not just about translating uh, your app. It's really about adjusting your offering. And the fact that you actually have to do that early on, I think it helps you build a great playbook. So you, you know, it's a bit harder early on, but you also get better early on. So it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Uh -huh. no, absolutely. I think we may be out of time almost, but I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing any, oh any alerts here. Um, I just want to ask one really other quick question because it's on my list and, I, and it sort of relates to this. It's a bit, it's a bit micro. Um, employee stock options at European tech companies. I've heard this recent debate, like some people say it's too low in Europe. So like because the European employees don't value stock, they don't think necessarily think stock is worth having because we haven't seen enough really big exits for employees. Um, and so there's been a sort of debate. It's Some firms say it should be 10%. Some firms, some uh, VCs say that companies should allocate more like 20%. So I just wondered, does Sotor have a view on that debate? Are we, do we not give enough stock away to employees in Europe? I think we have a lot. I know that we have a philosophy that we should always pay people well and have a high bar of expectations on execution and give up the people the opportunity to benefit from these investments. Every market has different levels at which you wish there was the market price to compensate people, but that is changing. As we move to a world of more remote work, as we move to a world of more and more global competition, we feel that wages and options and compensation will equalize. And so we we always have this emphasis on pay for the pay for the quality talent, pay them well, treat them well, is the uh, the narrative that we try to encourage our companies, but be prudent, you know, to the market dynamics uh, to build a strong enduring business. It's a balance you're trying to strike. I don't know, Luciana, if you had a different perspective. <laughs> I, I think you're right. Um, I think um, I will. I will say, in my experience with European companies, I, founders think in a very international manner, and they're really focused on on getting the best people. And getting the best people in Europe also means being generous when it comes to options. The other thing we're seeing more and more in Europe is giving early employees some liquidity with time. Um, and I think that's a good habit as well, because people start feeling and realizing, okay, this is, this is not just paper money. This is real money. Um, so I, I think the world is normalizing. By the way, I just on a side note, I'm noticing all of the Romanian love coming in on the chat oh, stream. I'm, I'm and not I'm that in, in post COVID, we have to do a big event in Romania because this yes. is just awesome to see Stop. so much Romanian love. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I hadn't even seen it yet. I love it. <laughs> Um, so I think I, I'm not getting a message say we're out of time uh, so I'm going to ask one more question um, secondary rounds so I'm seeing this um, over the last few years that a lot of companies are raising money but they're letting early shareholders um, sell some shares or all of their shares to an incoming investor um, and this used to be something that would happen very very late you know maybe I don't know series C, D, E, um, but it seems to sometimes be happening earlier. And um, in my experience, you get two kind of opinions from venture capitalists on this. 
some people say it's great and other people say it's it's far far too early to let people um cash out so yeah do, do you have a view on that um Luciano or Johnny? I, I would say it's really case by case. So I, I would not opine as a, as a general, yes, it's too early or too late. But I, what I would say is, as I mentioned before, I think giving people a little bit of early liquidity, whether it's early employees or whether it's the founder, I think can really give the opportunity to, to take this for another decade and to, to really be incentivized and, and do risk people's personal situation for a really long period of time. And it can encourage founders to really go at it for, and, and shoot for the stars. And, and I think that's great. I think it's a good thing. Uh -huh. um, right. I think that is it. That was, that was fantastic. I feel like we got through, like, we dispelled all the myths. And, uh... so. That's why we're here. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I really think we did, Steve. And, and I think based on the things that Matt and, and Luciana said, I think one way to wrap up kind of like what Seco is looking for from Europe is, is kind of like what uh, Sir Michael Moritz said at last year's slush, that the best companies are the creatures of founders' obsession. Is that right? Is that a good way to kind of like wrap it up what you're looking for? Absolutely. And we couldn't be more excited to be here and to continue that investment. All right. Thank you so much, Luciana, Matt and, and Steve for, for the great session. Thanks, Thank thanks you for having me. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.